said, my name is Bill Laboon. Uh, I'm a visiting lecturer at the University of Pittsburgh. We're going to talk about thinking functionally. Um, so what that means is taking the ideas of functional software and using them, even if we're not going to go out there and learn a functional language. You know, this is not going to be a lecture about uh, what is the syntax for Haskell or Clojure? But it's going to be, what are the, the really core ideas behind functional programming? How can they use it to help us, even if we're not going to use some of these languages that are, that are functional? OK, so first off, one thing that I've seen when people hear about functional programming, uh, they get scared. They think, oh, man, this, this is academia. This is something that's difficult. Uh, this is what they're either hearing or thinking when people talk about functional programming. Has anyone ever heard this phrase or seen this as a joke? Yeah. The funny thing is, it is actually true. But what, what I want to assure you of here is that we are not going to use any of these terms uh, in this. You know, if you really want to get into functional programming, yes, you, you will learn terms like this. Uh, but that's true of basically any language, right, or any paradigm. So I teach a, an intro to Java course as well, OK? And what I don't do is the first day of class talk about, all right, we're going to be using a uh, abstract singleton proxy factory bean. Right. Th these are all actually real, including the internal frame, internal frame, title pane, internal frame, title pane, maximize button window not focus state class. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I <laughs> yeah, the, any time you learn some sort of uh, uh, paradigm for programming, you're going to have to learn some terminology and some jargon. Uh, but that doesn't mean that like, that is the essential thing. If someone were to ask you, what is the, the core piece of object-oriented programming, most of you would not say, well, obviously, it is a bean context service provider bean info. Right? But that it does exist, right? So just like... You know, the terms monad and monoid and all of that, they, they do exist in functional programming. But to get the ideas, you don't need to be a PhD in category theory. Okay? You can take some of these ideas and use them in different languages uh, or any of your development uh, and get a lot of benefits. So what is functional programming if it is not all about monads and monoids? Uh, well, it's something people will fight about a little bit. If you're ever in the mood to spice up your Twitter feed or, or Facebook feed, you should write, uh, what, ask people, what is your definition of functional programming? Also, who is your favorite candidate for president this year? Uh, and you, you'll just watch all sorts of, I won't guarantee which of those will cause more, uh, more flaming, but there will definitely be some, some flaming going on. What I would like to do is talk about some of the more commonly known uh, paradigms, and I tried to condense uh, all of these into three sentences. So I've got imperative programming, object-oriented programming, and functional programming, all condensed into three sentences each. Uh, and we'll, we'll compare them, okay? And I'll show you an example of doing the same simple program in each of these uh, paradigms using pseudocode. Right. So imperative programming. This is what you might think of if you've programmed mostly in basic, COBOL, FORTRAN, if you only use static methods, um, a program is just a sequence of commands to the computer. Do this, then do this, then do this. And we can modify the state of the program, such as variable values or the environment, write to disk, whatever, by these commands. And we can group these together to make subroutines uh, uh, or... Um, uh, modules, right? We can, we can have sort of arbitrary groupings of the, these things as the program gets more complex. So for all of these uh, paradigms, I'm going to show you the exact same program written sort of as, as math and how I would pseudocode it into that paradigm. So square root 7 minus 2 plus 5 times 3. Well, A equals 7 minus 2. B equals 5 times 3. C equals A plus B. Square root of C. In each of these uh, lines, what we're doing is we're executing a command against some certain data, which is changing state. Uh, in this instance, we're creating a new variable a from the value of 7 minus 2. Uh, we are creating a new variable b, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so you see this very line by line kind of thing. 
Object-oriented programming, uh, which is you know, probably the most popular paradigm out there today, uh, most languages, you know, like, uh, Java, C Sharp, all of that. We think of a program as a series of objects, right? And these objects will have attributes and methods. That is, they have something that defines them as an object. They're, 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 they're variables, right? Uh, and methods, things you can do to them. And these objects will communicate with each other. And in so doing, uh, mutate themselves and mutate each other to produce some desired state of the system. And then, just like we could group things into subroutines or modules in imperative or procedural programming, in object-oriented programming, we can compose objects of other objects. E.g., a class has a collection of student objects, uh, and then maybe a professor object. Uh, and then both professor and student inherit from human. Right? We can put these together to make more complicated relationships. So here's my, my very object-oriented pseudocode, right? So what do we do? We're creating some new integer object with the value we call times on the five object, the times method, with the parameter three to make some new object that we put into an integer. Uh, and at the very end, once we've added all of these together, we call square root on the integer c, right? As opposed to the function sort of living by themselves, right? Uh, every method has to be associated with some object somehow. Everything is objects, objects all the way down. Okay. So most people are familiar uh, with uh, imperative and object-oriented programming. So uh, I didn't go too much into depth. This isn't like a review uh, of that. But functional programming, we're going to look a little bit more closely. So. The definition, really, of functional programming is that we look at programs as a uh, group of functions which can be applied to arguments. And those arguments can themselves be more functions, right? It's functions all the way down. Just like in uh, object-oriented programming, it's objects all the way down. These functions have referential transparency. Uh, so what I mean by that is uh, the return value should re rely only on the parameters. Anytime I say, uh, whatever, uh, a, a, a square root, right? If I ask for, you this, for the square root of four, am I, am I, what, what am I always going to get back? It's two. You know, there's nothing, I could replace square root of four with two in my program. It would make no difference, right? Every time I called square root of four, if I just replaced it with two, it's the same. It's referential transparency. And finally, data is immutable. That is, once we have some some piece of data, that data is not going to change. Okay, if I, there's no such thing really as a variable. Think of everything as a, a constant. If we want, to, we can uh, send data from one place to another, but we're not going to do it through variables. We're not going to save state through variables, okay? which is a really weird way of thinking about things. If you're used to uh, most of these more popular paradigms, you're like how, how can I do anything without variables? Variable, I, Variables are everywhere. Look, variables. I don't know why some of these are slower fading in and out. Uh, variables. Variables. I feel like there's that Steve Ballmer. He's like, developers, developers, developers. Variables, variables, variables. But we don't need variables, actually, with functional programming. All right, so let's look at a way of thinking of this same mathematical sequence, but from a functional perspective. So we've got a function, subtract, which is going to take some arguments, 7 and 2, give us some value, uh, 5, right? Uh, multiply, which is going to give uh, 5, 3. It's another function that takes some arguments and is going to return some value. Okay. That, those get passed to the add function, the results from those. And then that gets passed to this, the, the result of that gets passed to the square root function. Right? So it's, again, it's, it's functions all the way down. We're thinking of everything as functions. So if we define a program as just functions applied to functions, this is going to, have a, this is going to give us a few benefits. Okay? Uh, one, it tends to be more succinct code, uh, at least in, in, in my experience, that you, you find yourself uh, being able to express things using much fewer lines of code. And has everyone heard that famous E equals MC squared? Right? Errors equals more code squared. Right? The, the, the more code you add, it's going to drastically increase the number of defects uh, you have in, in your code. Okay? So if you can make things more succinct, think about things uh, uh, with fewer lines of code, you'll often find that 
you will also have fewer defects. It's going to be more modular. It's going to be easier to swap uh, functions in and out, right? as opposed to objects where oftentimes there's lots of in intertwining between things. If we have referential transparency of our functions, uh, we can just replace them instead, uh, with some other function that does the exact same thing. Whereas if you were working in objects, if you replace one method uh, in an object, you might have to modify uh, all of the variables that it refers to, all of the other objects that it calls, etc. Easier parallelism. Uh, for many of these uh, excuse me, for many of these other paradigms, you really are forced to do things in a sequential order. Right? If I tried to run the third line um, before the, the, the second line, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have some errors. Theoretically, I could run the the first line and the second line in parallel, right? They don't rely on each other. But unless we directly in our code say that I want this to run on one thread and this to run on another thread, which we would have to do with more code, which means more errors, right? Then it becomes difficult to parallelize things. However, with a lot of uh, functional languages, just be because you have these functions which exist sort of by themselves, right? They're independent. Uh, it's gonna be very easily easy to parallelize things. Uh, for example, in, in Clojure, if you want to do a map on something, uh, which just means if you have a list of values, do something to each of them. If you want to do it sequentially, you use the map command. If you want to do it in parallel for as many uh, 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 cores as you have, you just use the method pmap. That's the only thing you have to change your code to make it parallel. Right? It becomes very easy in many functional programming languages to extend out to arbitrary number of, uh, of cores or threads or processes or systems. Of course, it's different, right? You're thinking about things a little differently, right? That's one of the, the downsides, I think, of, of first getting into uh, functional programming is that the way to do things is often so different that you, know, you, you have a little bit of, of time before you can get back to the speed of writing code that you may have done in a language or a paradigm with which you're more familiar. The way I, the, the, the sort of breakthrough for me was realizing that I have done functional programming before. The command line is just functional programming, right? So we don't think about it, but if I have f of g of h of x, like that looks complicated and mathy and scary. But if I think about it as just going through a list of, um, a list of transformers basically, piping data from one thing to another, th these are exactly equal. If I take the value of whatever is in x, and I pass it to H and do something, and then pass it on to G and then do something, and then pass it on to F and then do something. Right? I haven't mutated any data. I've just taken whatever I had, like whatever I get from X, I'm gonna transform it using H, then send it on to G and send it on to F. Right? At each point, I'm just getting some data, doing something with it, sending it on. I'm not setting variables. Right? I'm thinking of things as just, all right, a function applied to x, and then a function applied to that, and a function applied to that. Okay, so I had mentioned uh, referential transparency, that is pure functions. What the ideal is, is that any function should just be replaceable by its value, right? So if I have square root of four, I can replace it by two. If I have you know, a, uh, the, the regular old, Java square root function, and I came up with the awesome bill square root function, I should just be able to swap in bill square root function and everything should work the same. And you might think this is the case, right, in whatever language you're working in now. Um, but it doesn't have to be. There are no guarantees, right? So I could have a square root function or method that does this. So I'm doing all sorts of things aside from just calculating the square root here, but there's nothing um, external to let me know that, right? So I'm, I'm going to write stuff to uh, uh, syst you know, standard out. I'm going to log stuff. Maybe there might be an error writing to a file uh, here. I'm going to increment my num calls, uh, num times called variable before returning anything, right? I'm doing all sorts of other stuff. Could I replace this code with two? If I call square root of four. No. Thank you. <laughs> I, I love when people answer rhetorical questions, so, so thank you. At, at least it means people listen, are listening to me. All right. 
right? So, but uh, in functional languages, we we ensure we can actually ensure that that this happens, right? We're going to say if I'm going to do x, I know that I will always be able to replace it out with some x prime without causing some other issue, like maybe. Uh, an overflow on num times called or not being able to write to a file. I can actually sort of cordon off that work somewhere else. So there, this, this concept of referential transparency that what a function does should ideally only be um, uh, determined by the arguments sent into it has a lot of really powerful implications, especially for software testing, okay, uh, and ensuring that you've written good quality code. So if the return value is entirely dependent on what we send in, that means that it's deterministic, right? Intermittent failures are going to be reduced. If I figured out that the square root of four works for two, then it should work every time I send in four, right? That doesn't mean that there aren't other possible areas that it, that it might fail. Maybe uh, it doesn't handle, you know, negative numbers. I don't have any support for complex numbers. So, uh, it, I never checked that it works with negative one. But I know once I have gotten this code working with negative, with, with four, it's always going to work for four. If I know that it works for eight, it's always going to work for eight. I don't have to worry that it works for eight unless you have some variable somewhere set something, or if you have a, a full disk, or if you've run out of memory, et cetera. Right? And the only thing to worry about checking is what the return value is. Right? You don't have to worry that it, you know, went off and wrote uh, to a database somewhere. You don't have to worry that it uh, modified some variable that's going to cause things to break elsewhere. This is great for unit testing, right? It's going to cause much less flakiness. Finally, immutable state. So if we don't have such a thing as a variable, if we can't change state, okay, um, that, that also means that uh, we need some way to get, we need some way to change things, right? We're not going to change something uh, on an object. We're not going to change a value, but we can get new ones, right? We can create something from that. Uh, so that means if I want something new, if I want to get some object that is like what, what let's say I have a student object. Okay, I, I, I apologize, I'm a, I'm a lecturer, and so like, when I look out, I see students, and I know none of you are students, but it's the first, first idea that always pops into my mind. Okay, so I have some student, but that student has uh, changed their name. I don't want to have to modify that student's name. Instead, I will get a new student who has a different name, okay, a new student object, which seems a little bit wasteful when it comes to performance, right? It seems like it might be a little difficult to uh, wrap your mind around, but it actually is going to cause us, excuse me, uh, give us a lot of benefits of dealing with uh, parallelism, of dealing with uh, uh, race conditions, things like that, because any time you have a reference to an object, you know what that object is. Nothing is going to be changing it underneath of you, uh, you know, midway through. Right? Similar to uh, in, in Carol's uh, uh, Rust talk, how there was the the, the value was being the value of the uh, collection that was being iterated through changed midway through, right? With functional programming languages, that that's also an impossibility, right? You, this is what it's one two three. If I want a diff, another list that has one two three four, well, I'm going to make a new list that has one two three four. Okay. So this is also going to simplify your code. It's going to help increase your knowledge of the system. You're going to know that if I have some a then whatever that A is, is always going to have the, the same uh, values, the same features. Uh, I don't need to have more mutators, right? The only time you're going to mutate something is when you initially create it. Uh, so you're, gonna, again, once again, going to reduce code. So a lot of this stuff you can do in, in basically any language. There, there are uh, functional libraries for Java. There are functional libraries for PHP. There are functional libraries for Scala to make it even more functional. Um, but that doesn't, just because it's easy to do or sort of baked in to some programming languages, doesn't mean that you can't take them and use them for whatever language you're going to use. If, if you come here and you're like, wow, these, these seem like some really cool things. You're like, well, you know what? You go to your boss on Monday and say, I think we should change our whole code base to Haskell. <laughs> All right, that'd be, that, that'd be cool if you do. If you do, let me know. I'd be curious to hear how it goes. <laughs> uh, but it's probably unlikely to happen. 
you, know, you, you probably will get laughed at, right? It was that little ha, 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 no. However, we can use some of these ideas, right? We don't have to just say, well, those exist in some other languages uh, that's no use for me. Okay. So first is to try to cordon off side effects. So what a side effect is, is anything that is not just returning a value. Okay. So here uh, I have a print greeting method, which takes a name uh, and then says, hello, name, and it uppercase is name. Okay, and then prints that out uh, to the screen. So there's some side effectful code here uh, that the system out print line. What's its side effect? It's going to print something to the screen, right? It's going to do something different than just return a value. Okay? However, there is some pure code in here. There is something that doesn't have a side effect, right? Uh, this little algorithm may be too strong of a word for it, but <laughs> this concatenation, I guess. Right? And anytime I send in the string Jane, it's going to return into the greet variable, uh, hello, Jane, when, and Jane is capitalized. Right? So we have some pure code, and we have some side effectful code. If we can strip out the pure code, that's going to be much easier to test in and of itself. Right? I explained some of the benefits of this, this pure code, the things you can focus on it. Uh, we can then have some method, which is we can specify, all right, this, this particular method has uh, side effects. This is something we have to be wary of. But we can test something. We can test the pure aspects of it much more easily. So here, I took out a get hello string. So it now returns hello plus name to uppercase. I now have a pure function here with no side effects. I do have a side effectful uh, method down here but it calls the pure one. Right? So pure functions can't call methods with side effects, right? because if it's pure, it shouldn't have any side effects. But a side effectful one could call a pure function. Notice as a, a sort of, a, almost as a side effect of this, uh, we've also gotten rid of, really, of, of any variables other than the arguments. Right? So now we have our side effectful method that calls our pure method. So we can now. Uh, test our pure method very effectively. Even though it's going to have the same functionality, you know, we've refactored it so that the, the code is going to be a little bit easier to test, a little bit more functional. Minimize nonlinear data sharing. So what I find interesting is that we've known that global variables in a program are bad for a long time, right? Probably lo longer than I've been alive. And I'm getting old. I notice more gray hairs, right, every time I get my hair cut. Okay. But we can also have classes and, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and instantiated classes right, that are as big as these old programs used to be. And we use the equivalent of global variables in them. right? We will have like a, a public int or even a private int or something that can be modified by all sorts of methods. And then the behavior of the program of individual methods depends upon that um, that piece of data that is not something that's just an argument to the function. It's something that could change underneath us, right? It's something that could uh, cause the program to fail in some cases, or excuse me, the method to fail in some cases and not others. And it might be difficult to track down because we depend upon things other than just what is the value we sent in. Okay? So try to minimize any access of data that is not just something that was passed in as an argument. So here is uh, my, my foo class. Um, and I've got a public void sort elements. Accepts no arguments and doesn't return anything. Okay. So unit testing this is going to, we're already off to a difficult start testing it, right? Uh, but we also depend upon all sorts of other things that are not related to the method, right? This uh, int array for results to read it, vals for what's going to be uh, inside of it. These might be null. Right? Who, we, the user may not have set them ahead of time. Who knows what the default sorting type is? Right? can be really problematic. Right? We depend upon these things other than just the arguments. Ah, this, this, is, this is just beautiful. Right? So here, the program, the, excuse me, the method only depends upon what we send into it. So if I send in uh, some particular value here and some particular value here, these are the only things I have to worry about. If I find some sort of defect, 
then I'm going to know, all right, it, it arises from these particular things that I passed in. It doesn't arise because some variable somewhere else is set differently, or there's something in the database that's wrong, right? So this is going to help you with debugging as well as testing. And finally, minimize mutable state. The more moving parts you have, the more things you modify, the more places there are for defects to hide. Uh, also, if you have your code uh, working in some sort of, you know, if you're running things in parallel, uh, you have more difficulties here, right? Uh, by, you might change something underneath. So what I would recommend is whenever you're thinking that you should be mutating a variable, so for here I have some complex number has uh, a real and imaginary part, and later on I say, well, we should add some constant c to each of these. Well, I'll just set it in, uh, in the z object. No, once a variable is created, it's done. Right? It's, unlike people, variables should not grow. Right? Uh, they should just, all right, here's what they are. That is what they shall be forever. Okay? Make, make another one. Make a Z2 instead of just reusing Z. Okay? So you can take all of these ideas, and there's, there are going to be some downsides. So many of these things uh, are going to be huge performance problems uh, in a language like Java. Okay, you know, creating lots of new objects. If you, we didn't talk about this, but if you use recursion instead of a loop, you might cause a stack overflow. You can use some of these ideas, but it doesn't always mean that you're going to understand it completely or it's not going to have uh, a bad impact on your code. Okay? Uh, so what I would recommend is that if you're really interested in functional programming, if this kind of whetted your appetite, uh, learn an actual functional programming language. Okay? Uh, I was a consultant for a company called FP Complete, which uh, works on commercializing Haskell, so I'm kind of like partial to Haskell, uh, but I'm not gonna say that that's the best language for everyone to learn. Uh, there are all sorts of other ones. Elm is, is known for its, its wonderful error messages. Uh, F Sharp is a functional programming language uh, if you're on the Microsoft uh, stack. Um, uh, Elixir is a, uh, based, uh, based on Erlang, which I know there have been some people that are like really into that for uh, large-scale concurrent systems. Um, Closure, Scheme, and Racket are all sort of Lisp-like uh, functional programming languages. So there's, there's a whole world out there. This is just a, a, a sample of them. And I recommend that you really go out and try to sort of expand your horizons. Think of a different way to look at the programs you write. Right? All of these uh, paradigms are just different ways to look at something that could cause the same functionality. I could write um, the same code uh, in Haskell or COBOL or Ruby or Java. It might be difficult, or excuse me, it might, they might be different under the hood, but I can make them have the exact same output. Okay? Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're all of equal, uh, you know, uh, all equally well written. It doesn't mean that they're all doing the exact same things. Right. So learn a functional programming language. I think it'll really uh, expand your mind. Uh, if you uh, want to talk more about any of this stuff or, or anything else, please feel free to tweet at me uh, or email me. Thank you very much.